Fun stuff. We're going to look at the Nikon 7200 2.8 versus the new 100 to 400 S lens for the Nikon Z mirrorless system. We'll mix it up a little bit by testing those with the 1.4 and 2.0 teleconverters. And we'll also talk a little bit about the performance characteristics of the 500 PF on the FTZ adapter and where that fits into the mix. Hey everyone, Hudson, welcome to this week's video. We're gonna be doing some fun stuff with teleconverters and long lenses, analyzing images and test images. Um, and that's largely because a lot of you've been asking for that with these particular lenses and teleconverters. You know, your questions and comments and emails drive the content on this channel and I wanna thank everyone for participating. Quick reminder before we launch in, uh, office hours are big group photography meetings that are free on YouTube and Zoom. Uh, they're on a little bit of a hiatus for, for the month of, of March. We're going to be jumping back into those in April. But please sign on to the HudsonHarry.com slash office hours page and leave us some questions because we're going to go through those questions and answer a bunch of them in recorded sessions in Death Valley and Joshua Tree while Rick and I are out running these workshops that we take off for in a very few short days. And I'm so stoked to be back on the road with an awesome group of photographers creating, learning, and just having a general good time in beautiful places again. So you guys send us in some questions. We'll answer them and post those videos. And in April, we'll be back to doing the office hours. So check in at hudsonary.com slash office hours. Again, links to everything I'm talking about are in this video's description. If you click on the title or show more, you can find all those links. But I keep links to all the stuff I use at hudsonhenry.com slash ATS links for you to go to check out anytime and I really appreciate your using those because they help me out. All right, so, you know, this, this is one that I've been kind of scratching my head and racking my brain a bit uh, with. I took the, the 100 to 400 and shot almost exclusively with it on my kite surfing trip to Mexico uh, a few weeks ago and, and got some great images. I shot some landscape stuff with it as well. I've been using the 70 to 200. It's my favorite 70 to 200 that I've ever laid hands on. It's so sharp, it's so beautiful. Um, and, and I've been playing around with the two teleconverters, the 1.4 and the 2.0 that came out for the Z-mount. Uh, and we're gonna go through, we're gonna look at some real world images from these lenses, along with some images from my 500 PF. You know, I had thoughts when this 100 to 400 arrived that, well, I'll, I'll be able to get rid of one or the other or both of these now that I have this kind of all-in-one lens. And while I love this lens, it's funny, I'm just not quite ready yet. I haven't done enough work. I need to work with all three of them a little bit more. I know, you'll see in the video why, but I know I'm not getting rid of my 500 PF. Um, it comes down to these two. And, and let's just dive in, let's look at some images and let's look at some test images. You know, I'll, I'll show you the methodology that I use to test these lenses. Um, it's something you can easily do at home with your own lenses to judge their performance characteristics and how you should potentially be thinking about using them in different situations. So we'll jump in, we'll talk about all that. We'll talk about these teleconverters and I'll tell you why I'm having a hard time deciding what to get rid of and what to keep. All right, so some of you might've seen my 24 to 120 versus 24 to 70 video a couple weeks ago. I kind of talk about my testing methodology in that with how to set up your lens on a solid tripod in front of a brick wall, really look at how it performs at different apertures, which can be really valuable for testing lenses that you already have and you're trying to determine you know, how well do they perform, how should I use them in different situations. We're gonna do look at a little of that with these three lenses, the 70 to 200, the 100 to 400, both of those with the teleconverters on them, we'll compare them. We're also going to look at the 500 PF, just talk about how ripping sharp that thing is wide open. But first, I just want to run through some images that I've taken uh, with all three lenses to kind of talk about why I have a, such a hard time choosing between these three lenses. And I'm here in, in the Lightroom library, um, just looking at the grid view. I'm going to go ahead and jump into the loop view. You can just hit the E key or click right here on the loop icon there in the, in the toolbar. This is a picture of my son Pike at my mom's farm by her spinning wheel on her couch in really low light. You can tell I'm at 4000 ISO with my Z7, f2.8. That 70 to 200 just does such a beautiful rendering of shallow out of focus detail, of shallow 
depth of field and out of focus details. It's bokeh is spectacular. I mean, you look at that, his eye is the only thing sharp. And in this low lit situation, if I was trying to do this with my 100 to 400, it's just not likely to work. You know, you could use an 85 1.8 prime or a, but it wouldn't give you that same reach. You, you know, the, the, the 70 to 200 is just a wonderful lens. If you like to work with shallow depth of field, low lit situations, portraits, you know, here's my good friend Andy Atkins, amazing filmmaker. He's been making a film about this old growth forest here in Oregon that unfortunately uh, was, was, fell prey to a huge fire that we had a couple of years ago and you know that's taken his film in a new direction and this is us up looking at it in the aftermath of that burn um, and you know at 2.8 look at how the burnt forest is rendered and it even stays beautiful as you stop down if you want to bring some more detail of the burnt forest in you know here it is at f 5.6 just fantastic portrait lens you know also great for action razor sharp um, you know this is shooting with my z7 II in florida um, birds in flight, kite surfing here on Savi Island. Uh, my, my friend Cristiano is just an amazing young snowboarder kite surfer. Um, you know, it's, it's a great action lens if your subjects are close in and in range. Great running around shooting, you know, my kids running around. This is back in Florida again with Pepper playing with some of the local kids in the surf. Um, Pepper and my mom out on the farm, you know, that shallow depth of field. Here's f3.5. This lens just has a beautiful way of working in low light and rendering subjects with beautiful shallow out of focus details. It's also been a great lens for me in the landscape. Sometimes you're in those scenes where you've got an extractive landscape and you just want to take a slice of it where the light's amazing. You know, I've noticed this lens does really well shooting into backlight. You have to be a little careful. Sometimes there's a tiny bit of, of ghosting. I haven't really seen any flare issues with it. This is in the Palouse. Both these shots are Palouse. Um, up in Olympic National Park, my, my good friend Steve with Pike, you know, shooting into backlight at sunset. It, again, you know, that shallow out of focus background is just beautiful, f2.8 there. Um, you know, again, shooting in low light situations, you know, well, this isn't so low light, but just the way that it renders that out of focus background, I love, you know, adds to the mystery that the, the, the focus is falling off into the distance with this sea lion on the buoy from a, a boat on my Brookings workshop. Love it with wildlife. You know, again, you can just draw attention to your subject at that shallow depth of field. That's what the 70 to 200 2.8 does for you. You know, in my mind is that that shallow depth of field, that low light work, keeping my ISO down to a really workable range at ISO 560 here, 250th of a second. Um, that's gonna be, you know, it's trickier to do with the 100 to 400. Um, and it's just, a again, wonderful portrait lens. Um, and when you need to get sharp in the landscape, you know, here I'm stopped down to F9, half a second to blur the falls in Yellowstone, our Yellowstone workshop last fall. You know, and, and edge to edge, no real problem with sharpness here. Um, you know, just a, a great, great lens. Now let's move over to the 100 to 400. It's so versatile. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to, you know, having 70 to 200 or 500 um, as my kind of range with the lenses I commonly carry. It's wonderful to be able to zoom around and still get nice sharp images you know it, it doesn't have as amazing ability to blur the background for a portrait subject you know here's 200 millimeters wide open at f5 250 millimeters um you know but still lovely the way it does render out of focus is nice it's not able to really separate your subject from the background as much but it has a really wonderful way uh, of its rendering of out of focus details it's sharp there's no doubt about that sharp wide open when you're shooting your subjects um, and again, that range, being able to bounce between 400 and 350 and 200 is wonderful in a nice handheld lens. I've been blown away by its ability to work in backlight. You know, I just was testing it down in Baja and you can see I'm at 32 thousandth of a second, something you can really only do with the Z9. Um, F11, ISO 64, this is shooting straight into a very hot sunrise. No flare no ghosting going on here you know the, the whole scene has to be underexposed to not totally blow the sun out as a blob it's insane um i i couldn't get the thing to to, to ghost and flare um which is really really cool 
you know, it, it, it works nicely. I like its color rendition. This was a scene that wouldn't be nearly as great with my 70 to 200 because I zoomed out to 400. Up above this beautiful bit of cloud, it was just turning kind of yellow to bland sky. There was just a band of clouds way out on the horizon by this, you know, stretch of headland that sticks out. Uh, into the bay from La Ventana, and I love the way that you know those clouds were out there at 400 millimeters. This is a real extractive landscape. That's a wonderful thing to be able to do. That's that range that it has. Sharpness, not really an issue. Here we are wide open at 400 millimeters um, with the Z9's eye detect autofocus. Uh, this is just untouched, no sharpening whatsoever. Pretty awesome, you know, clearly <laughs> tracking action. And the thing is, you know, if I was trying to work with my 500, there's no way I could take this shot. I wouldn't be able to rack back to 250 millimeters. Um, this is wide open at 250, f5, you know, plenty sharp. Really, really cool to be able to have that ability. Here's that shot my friend Jasmine got that's just so amazing of Christopher launching an aerial maneuver. Now we're slapping the 1.4 teleconverter on here. That's why I, I marked this red. You know, and I had no problem working with the 100 to 400 with the 1.4 teleconverter. The images it renders are plenty sharp. Um, the, the focus seemed to work quite well. I imagine in real low light, it might get problematic, but you can see I'm able to work at, you know, F, F7.6 here, uh, F8 racked all the way out is your minimum aperture, but the camera's able to focus pretty well at F8. Slap in the two times teleconverter on it, I noticed a certain uh, loss of sharpness. It's just not as sharp as I, I it's, it's not bad, and with some sharpening, it'd be okay. But the other thing about it is that out at F11, you know, particularly if you get into good light situations, you're gonna, you're gonna be having a really high ISO to get a fast enough speed to be shooting wildlife. And you're also, I noticed autofocus affected uh, by it. It was just not tracking as well when it's, minimum, when it's maximum aperture is f11 with that two times teleconverter on this lens. It just slows it down. It doesn't have enough light coming in for the autofocus to be as amazing as you'd expect from the Z9. Um, you know, and again, just not quite as sharp. Look at the 1.4 and look at the 2.0. You know, he's closer, but I, I would rather enlarge this image and sharpen it a bit than start with this one. It's just, you can tell even from the wave and, the, and him and the dog, it's not quite as sharp. Now talking about sharp, let, let's talk about what makes the 500 so special. It's ludicrously sharp. This is in Kauai, I'm a Kauai workshop, you know, a monk seal, wide open. This lens is just amazing. And you know, people ask, well, how does it autofocus on the Z system? Well, this is taken with my original Z7. It had no problem tracking these kite surfers down in the Pistol River near my Bandon workshop. I mean, these are uncropped, not much editing, you know, just, just nailing focus on fast action. I have very few out of focus images. This one might be mildly out of focus, um, but you know, acceptable enough for the amazing shot that it is. You know, portraits of birds and wildlife. This is with my D500 in Yellowstone. Um, just, but the thing is, with the 100 to 400, I could also turn to, to horizontal orientation and rack back and get the whole buffalo with the trees back there. Um, so, you know, there is that lack of versatility. You, if you can move your feet and get into a position where the wildlife are framed just right at 500 millimeters, there's nothing better than this lens. If you're shooting things that are way out distant, nothing better than working with this lens, in my opinion, particularly handheld. But in those situations like this, we were kind of surrounded by buffalo. Everybody in the workshop up against the van in Yellowstone. Yellowstone in the fall is so lovely. I can't wait to get back there this year with a workshop crew. But, you know, you couldn't really move to get out far enough away with the 500 PF because you don't want to get too close to the buffalo that were all around us and too far away from the van. So again, you know, here's another situation in Yellowstone on the workshop last fall where, you know, this, this bighorn sheep is moving toward us down this river valley and you know this was the last shot i was able to get the whole ram in the frame when it got down by the water i have my 500 millimeter on it and man i wish i had a 100 to 400 to be able to rack back a little bit um and not be you know it's fine i love this shot but i think it would be even better if i had the whole ram and a little bit more of that river in the frame 
you know, this situation, it's, this is where it works out perfect. But if that bull elk takes a couple more steps, I was up on the roof of my van to have an unobstructed view in Yellowstone again. And, you know, it's, if it moves toward me, I'm going to be stuck with just doing portraits of its head. Portraits with the 500 millimeter can be beautiful. It's more likely you're going to be working on uh, candid subjects because, you know, you need to be walkie-talkie distance away to be doing portraits with the 500. But even at f5.6, it renders really nice out-of-focus details back there. I love the way that DC's sharp here with his Sony and then Roman is kind of falling out of focus back there and then the fall color. This is again in Yellowstone. Um, oh no, this is in the Tetons photograph and some bison. Let's talk about portraits really fast before we go in and, and really analyze how these lenses perform up against each other head to head. Um, I'm just going to say the 70 to 200 is my favorite lens of this bunch to shoot portraits with. It's my second favorite lens to shoot portraits with. I love the 105 1.4 for its even more amazing bokeh. Um, you know, it's more ability to just melt the background into a, a blur of beautiful color. But here's at 100 millimeters, my, my lovely wife Stacy uh, at f2.8 with the 70 to 200 S. And I just love the way that her hair is falling out of focus. You know, it's, it's really all just about her eyes and wide open. It's nice and sharp in that center area, the frame where you, you know, this whole region in here where you want to be getting your portrait subjects razor sharp. Um, if we take a look, here's the 100 to 400 at 200 millimeters. You know, a decent portrait length. F5, that's wide open for it. It's nice and sharp. No two ways about that. This is rendering. Give it a second. There we go. Nice and sharp. Maybe even a little sharper than the 70 to 200. You know, but you don't get that same amazing fall off. It's not as, you know, it's F5. That's just what you're dealing with. You don't have that F2.8. Um, there's just something special about that. Um, but, you know, certainly usable. I mean, if you want to shoot a portrait with the 100 to 400, it'll do a fine job. Um, here it is at 400 millimeters. Now you're getting into that, that territory where you're going to need to be shouting at a distance from your portrait subject. Um, you know, walkie-talkie or shouting at a distance. But, you know, you get a little bit more uh, blurred background, but it's still, we're at f5.6. Now let's go with the 500 PF. You know, with the 500, um, I don't know why I'm stopped down to f7.1 here, but you can see it's rendering a beautiful out of focus details in the background. But again, you need a walkie talkie. It's not, you know, 400 and 500 long lenses to be working with portrait subjects. All right, let's look at some of my brick wall testing. And if you watched my 24 to 70 uh, f4 versus 24 to 120 um, uh, f4 S lens shoot out a couple of weeks ago, I talked about how I set up for these brick walls. I'm going to put that video in this video's description. If you look in the full description of that other video, you can see my sort of testing methodology. It's something easy for you to do, and it'll tell you a lot about the lenses that you work with. But I'm going to use it to compare these three lenses. Um, just for sharpness and you know for critical detail. This is a nice textured wall We can have a look at lenses side by side and see what we think about sharpness one versus the other So let's start off with the 500 PF because it's just a special lens wide open f 5.6 You know all these tests are standardized where we're looking at things at the same aperture same ISO um, and you know here's f 5.6 wide open the 500 pf you can see up here where we are in the frame what we're looking at you know let's move down sort of center middle still really sharp wide open let's move down to the edge really sharp i'm going to come back to a copy of this towards the end of our look at these images and you'll see why it's so special after we look at, at the other two lenses primes just have more performance capability than zoom lenses. Zoom lenses have to make compromises because they're made to zoom and do a lot more. I, I want to take a look at 100 millimeters with both the 100 to 400 and the 70 to 200. Let's compare the two. And we're going to use this compare view. You can just hit the C or click this XY. 
Um, and you can see we're, we're looking at the fit view here. We have the 100 to 400 on the left and we have the 70 to 200 on the right. And we're looking at them both at f8. You know, let's, let's think about, we know these lenses perform well. Just from the images we've looked at, we know they're nice and sharp, even wide open in their centers. Let's think if we were shooting them in the landscape and we really wanted everything sharp and have a look here. Um, relatively comparable in the center, I would give potentially the edge to the 100 to 400 by just a smidge. I don't know, it's pretty, it's pretty apples to apples here. But as we start moving, you know, I'll actually grab this little square here and we'll move down sort of center middle. You know, still pretty close, but again, uh, yeah, you know, you'd have a hard time choosing between the two at this point, which is a great piece of news for the 100 to 400. But as we start getting out into the outer corner, the surprising thing is I find the 100 to 400 a little bit sharper than the 70 to 200 at f8. Um, you know, let, let's have a look at the two at f11 instead. I'm going to just switch these up. Now we're looking at f11 and the 70 to 200 is sharpening up and competing a little bit better here as we, as we moved. We're, we're still, well, we're still here in the center. I thought we'd moved out to the edge, but we're actually moved back to the center when I switched images here. I still think the one, the, even in the center, the 100 to 400 is just a smidge sharper. Looking at them close, it's not anything to write home about, but it's a smidge sharper. As we move down through the image towards the edge, I'm going to just drag that guy, looking at them both. I think the 100 to 400 is definitely sharper. Um, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with either of these images. We're looking at a 46 megapixel Z72 file. The reason I'm not using the Z9 is that I, I don't have the final profiles for these images. Adobe hasn't really finished them up. Um, so you're kind of looking at prototype profiles in Lightroom and Adobe Camera Raw. And also, uh, I, I calibrated these lenses using Rycam Focal before using AFS Pinpoint Autofocus to do these tests. You know, again, they're really close. They're really, really close. Maybe out here at the extreme edge, it starts coming back to the 70 to 200. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't junk either of these lenses for not performing the way you might want. Um, let's have a look here. This one is the um, 200 millimeters wide open. I'm gonna actually jump back into my, into my um, just standard loop view. This is 200 millimeters wide open f2.8. Um, so all the way zoomed out on the 70 to 200 2.8s. And let's just look at that for sharpness. You can see there's some vignetting wide open at f2.8. That's to be expected. This lens is wide open and gathers a lot of light. When we zoom in, it's really nice and sharp in its center at 200 millimeters. Um, you know, I'm not comparing it because I don't have 2.8 on the other one. This is that, that, that shot, those shots that I showed where I'm saying you just can't get the same thing because you won't have that wider aperture with the 100 to 400. And you can see they designed it to be nice and sharp in the center, moving down through sort of the, the mid range of the image, coming down into that sort of middle area, still nice and sharp. And it starts falling off a little bit and you get to the edge. That's kind of to be expected at f2.8. But, you know, really nice performance. That's, this is the, the, the thing that makes the 70 to 200 so hard for me to get rid of is how sharp it is wide open in the center and how beautiful it renders out of focus details that aren't out, all out at the same distance. All right, so let's jump back again and start doing a little bit more comparison at 200 millimeters with these two lenses. So I'm gonna jump back into my compare view, 100 to 400 on the left still, 70 to 200 on the right. Um, and we're, we're looking at them both at f8 here, just to kind of think about more landscapey um, situation. Let's pull it to the center. All right, so I'm gonna say that at 200, just straight lenses, the 100 to 400 is the clear winner for sharpness in the center. Um, let's pull down a little bit. And it's still staying sharper. Take a look at this detail here and this detail here. Um, yeah, as we come down into the edge, definitely sharper than the 70 to 200. So doing really, really well, this lens is. You know, let's, let's have a look at those two at F11 and see if that helps the 70 to 200 stopping down a little bit more. Um, zoom in here on the both of them, center it up. I still give the edge to the 100 to 400. 
scrolling down towards the outer edge. It's a little closer now. You know, I'd say I still give the edge by a little bit to the 100 to 400, not much. So the 100 to 400 is a nice sharp lens. All right, Let, let's have a look. Let's say uh, we'll go back into the loop view. Let's say we're gonna look at the 70 to 200 with the 1.4 teleconverter. Um, so just at 100 millimeters, we're gonna, we're gonna think about that, at, you know, putting that 1.4 on. How does it hold up to having the 1.4 teleconverter? Really quite well. You know, as I look through this, I don't see much image degradation moving through. This is wide open at f4, you know, but you lose that f2.8 setting, it's gonna to go to f4 when you put the, the teleconverter on it. Well, let's switch it up and have a look. How does it, how does it handle at 280 millimeters? This is all the way out where you really want the teleconverter. Nice and sharp in the center, just like we saw at 200 millimeters wide open with the 70 to 200. How are we looking for vignetting? Still a bit of vignetting, not as much as it is without the teleconverter, oddly enough, it feels like to me. You know, you can look at them down here. That, that straight up shot 200 is at 2.8 is definitely more vignetted than with the teleconverter at 200 millimeters, bumping it out to 240. So this is the 1.4, nice and sharp in the center. If you're shooting birds in flight and things like that, and it's holding pretty well to the edge, it starts losing it. Just like we saw, you know, it's magnifying that lack of sharpness wide open out at the edge that that lens displays. Um, you take a look at it at f11. How does that shape up the middle? Wow, the middle's really sharp at f11, you know, if you're doing some landscape-like scenes, and it's holding up better out to the edges, just like it did when we stopped down the lens without the teleconverter. So, you know, I'd have no problem using this lens with the, uh, the 1.4 teleconverter, absolutely none. Um, you know, here's the 100 to 400 with the 1.4 teleconverter. It's also staying nice and sharp. You know, it's not maybe as sharp as the 70 to 200 is with the 1.4. Interestingly enough, I think the 100 to 400 handles teleconverters less well than the 70 to 200. You know, we're out at f6.3 here. Let's have a look at it, um, 280 millimeters. So, but we're at f7.1, I think that's probably wide open uh, still. Where that's mainly where you're gonna shoot with a teleconverter. You're trying to get more reach to shoot wildlife and that sort of thing. It's nice and sharp as we move out toward the edge. It's staying pretty sharp. I actually think it performs a little bit better at 200 than it does at 100. And I think that the 100 to 400 performs just at its peak as it's moving out to the longer part of its range. It's good at 100, but it's better at 200. And you can see that here with the teleconverter magnifies that. All right, well, let's have a look at it at 560, maxed out. This would be, you know, your 400 millimeter setting. Wide open is F8 with this. You know, I think again, yeah, I think the middle range of this lens is at its sharpest. So wide open here, you, you lose a little sharpness, but it's still pretty darn good. I mean, that's good detail right out to the edge. You can see where we are over here. It's not bad at all, it's certainly usable. I, I wouldn't hesitate to use this lens with the 1.4. You know, let's stop down a little bit to F11. Say you were thinking landscape -y. it's sharper yet. Again, you know, just stopping down a stop makes a difference. Still losing a little sharpness way out at the extreme corner, um, but you know, nice, 560, pretty great. Would I choose the 500 PF? Let's jump back to that and remember how sharp, how wickedly sharp that is, I would certainly choose the 500 PF if given a choice. Um, it's, just, it's just so ridiculously razor sharp. Okay, well, I promised we'd talk about the 2.0 teleconverter too, and we'll do some more comparisons using the 2.0 teleconverter, because you know that 200 with the 2.0 teleconverter comes to 400, just like the 100 to 400. Well, here we go. Here's the 70 to 200 with the 2.0 teleconverter. We're at, at about, I tried to set it at 100 um, to compare. And so we're out at about 210. There's a little potential loss of sharpness, but it's not bad. And it, it holds pretty well across the frame. We're wide open here. Wide open on the 2.8 becomes F5.6. You lose some stops of light. Throwing that on there, it's pretty darn sharp. How about if we stop down a little bit um, to F8? Woo, nice and much sharper. You can see that's improving that teleconverter's performance. So at F8, it's pretty darn good, the 2.0 teleconverter on the 70 to 200. So you wanna kinda of keep that in mind. You're gonna get a sharper image at, at F8 than you would at 5.6 wide open. Um, if 
we go to F11, it gets sharper. It, it, it stays sharp in the middle. I still think F8 might be your, your primo. You start getting a little diffraction. F8, nice and sharp, all the way moving out. You know, I'm not changing anything except aperture in these images. Um, all right, so let's zoom back out. And let's have a look at 400 millimeters on the 100 to 400 versus 400 millimeters on the 70 to 200 with the 2.0 teleconverter. So this is a bare lens on the left, the 100 to 400 and the 70 to 200 with a 2.0 teleconverter. Let's have a look um, and we'll get it centered up here. You know, I, I think looking at these two, it's pretty close in the middle. Both are at f5.6, um, pretty darn close. I don't know which one I would choose is better, but the minute you start moving away from the center, the 100 to 400 starts to win the race. Um, and as we come down, you start to see the 70 to 200 is just nowhere near as sharp, not as much detail, um, and it keeps falling off from there. It just gets less and less sharp and, and um, usable to me as we get further from the center at the same, at the same aperture. Let, let's look at them both at F11 um, and have a look, the 100 to 400 on the left, the 70 to 200 on the right, yeah. Wow, you know, if you're doing a landscape shot, um, you definitely are gonna have a nice, sharper, more detailed image with the 100 to 400 bare than you will with the 70 to 200 with the 2.0 teleconverter. Now, that said, the 70 to 200 with the 2.0 teleconverter is surprisingly good. You know, I, I have never really been very happy, as I said, with a 2.0 teleconverter on a zoom lens, but you know, this is not bad. This really isn't bad. Um, I'm not gonna keep the 2.0 teleconverter just because I think there is some performance drop off and there's a lot of performance drop off with the 100 to 400. And I know I'm not getting rid of the 100 to 400. It's versatility is something that I need in the type of work I do where I'm mixing it up between landscape and birds in flight and wildlife and having that reach from all the way from 100 to 400 just so useful when I'm traveling out there. Let's look at a couple more things here. You know, here's the 100 to 400 um, with the 2.0 teleconverter and, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. The 100 to 400 with the 2.0 teleconverter just really starts breaking down. Now we know that at 100, the 100 to 400 is a little less sharp than it is as you, as you zoom that lens in. Um, but that's, this is as close as I can get it focused. Wide open is F9 with the 2.0 teleconverter um, at, at, you know, at its open at the 100 millimeter setting on the lens, which becomes 200 millimeters, just not very sharp. If I, if I stop down um, to F11, you know, take it, take it not even a full stop, it gets a little sharper. It's just throughout the frame, it's not particularly sharp. What if we tried 800 millimeters, um, you know, way out at the other end where the lens performs a little bit better than it does at 100, but we've got that, that 2.0 teleconverter. It is, it's a little bit sharper. I mean, you could argue it's not unusable. Um, the sharpness falls off as we move down towards the edge. Um, you know, you have a look at that. And it's not terrible. It really isn't, but it's not something I would use. I would much rather um, shoot a nice sharp image um, and, and, and enlarge it than use an image that started out a little bit soft because of the teleconverter. And here, and we have such great algorithms in our software to do that with. I would rather shoot the image with my 500 PF in a landscape situation uh, and, and sharpen it. Look at that. And then, you know, once again, coming back out, let's look at that. You know, this is 800, granted, but you know the sharpness just doesn't even come close to comparing. So, to me, you know, the hard part of this all coming back is is choosing between <laughs> giving up the ability to do this shallow depth of field with such beautifully rendered details, as well as you know that ability to work in really low lit situations and still keep a high image quality because of that wide open aperture and its light gathering ability. And the zoom range of 70 to 200 being so great in there versus the versatility of being able to zoom around and you know go from everything from a, a really good portrait capable lens 
to dial in it back to 250 millimeters to keep my subjects in the frame while they're moving. Um, you know, I, I find that really, really valuable. And then the 500 just being so wickedly amazing, sharp, um, and, and just, you know, you saw the performance wide open. It's tough to choose between these three lens, lenses, you know. For me personally, because I don't have to get rid of any of them and I have all three, I can't quite get rid of the 70 to 200. We saw the 100 to 400 is sharper as you do a lot of tests across its range. Um, and it's certainly sharper than the 70 to 200 with the 2.0 teleconverter or even the 1.4 teleconverter. I think the 70 to 200 can work all right with the 2.0 and the 1.4 teleconverter, certainly the 1.4. I think if you're a person who, whose primary thing that they do is landscapes where you're doing a little bit of extractive landscapes, you, you shoot a lot of portraits of people, you shoot a lot of things with shallow depth of field and you love to draw the person's eye with what's sharp and in focus in the frame, your 70 to 200 2.8S is one of the most beautiful lenses for that kind of work ever made. If you're a person who loves to shoot distant wildlife, small birds, things that you have a hard time filling the frame with, the 500 PF is this amazing lightweight handheld razor sharp lens. And if you're a person who shoots a whole plethora of different stuff and you want something that can do a nice portrait and can zoom around and shoot all kinds of different things from 100 millimeters to 400 millimeters, that 100 to 400 is sharp and nice. I wouldn't use it with the 2.0 teleconverter, but the 1.4 is just fine. So for me, I'm gonna keep the three, I'm gonna ditch the 2.0 teleconverter, and I'm gonna spend this year, you know, traveling around on workshops and destinations where I shoot with both the 70 to 200 and the 100 to 400, and I'm gonna see which lens I settle to using most. Have a look at how many images or keepers from the year. And if the 100 to 400, or if the 70 to 200 is sitting on my shelf, I don't think it's going to lose any value over the upcoming years, and I, I'll probably consider passing it on to someone who'll use it more later. That's the one I would get rid of of the bunch. I would keep the 100 to 400, the 1.4 teleconverter, and the 500 PF if I had to get rid of one. But I love what this lens does, particularly with portraits. All right, so there you have it, folks. It's just a tough call. You know, the, the one thing I, I will say, you know, I, I did a video recently between the 24 to 120 and the 2470 f4. I'll put a link to that in this video's description where I just said the 24 to 120 thumps the 2470 f4 that I have loved, and I'm going to be getting rid of that. I can't do that with these lenses, and I think by watching the image reviews and test reviews that I just did, you can see why. You know, the 500 pf is just so insanely sharp even wide open, clear across its frame. It's just a precision tool for distant subjects. And it focuses so fast, even through the FTZ adapter, that it's just a magnificent, hand-holdable, long uh, weapon that I, I can't consider getting rid of. The 70 to 200 is so fabulous for portraits and landscapes and places where you need beautiful out-of-focus details rendered or you need precision edge-to-edge -edge sharpness out in a distant landscape where you're trying to get just that sort of extractive landscape, that one bit of the scene that has spectacular light. The 100 to 400 bridges the gap between those two and gives you a tremendous amount of versatility to be zooming around. If you're shooting sports, action, or wildlife, this thing, you know, there are those situations where this is just too much lens. This one, you can zoom, you can zoom back. It gives you the versatility. And I can see a lot of situations where my whole kit would consist of these two lenses, the, the 24 to 120, and the 100 to 400, it just covers everything that I need. Um, so, you know, what my plan is going forward here is to take both of these lenses with me along on workshops and field assignments where I'm vehicle based and see if I can work with the 100 to 400 and if I'm happy with the results and do some things where back to back I shoot scenes with both and analyze the results. And, you know, I may find myself coming to a place where I can part with the 70 to 200, but there's just so much image quality in this particular lens. When it comes to the teleconverters, I'm keeping the 1.4 and I'm gonna be returning the 2.0. You know, I could see a case for, you know, if you decide you don't need the versatility of the 100 to 400, you just keep the 70 to 200 and both of these teleconverters. There's a slight image degradation with any zoom lens I've ever used with a 2.0 teleconverter. And that's just a sad fact. It's more pronounced in the 100 to 400 than it is in the 70 to 200, but it's there. You know, the only time I've ever used 2.0 teleconverters and been completely satisfied is with the big, expensive, fast primes that they're made to go with. Um, and we really don't have those yet for the Z system, but they're coming. 
Um, and for me, this is just this is just gonna give me the 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 feeling like I have more reach, but then I may not be as happy with the results in the aftermath. So I'm gonna rely on having this stable of three lenses and this one 1.4 teleconverter. Um, and I think that that's where I'm gonna sit for now. I hope that the results that I ran through help you in making a decision about what to buy or what to get rid of. It really depends on what you do. And I'm such kind of a jack of all trades, travel and adventure photographer, that there are times where I need this versatility and there's times where I need this reach and there's times where I need the spectacular beauty that this lens can render. So they're sort of for three different things. All right, so that's it for this week. Uh, remember, submit those questions for Rick and I. We'll be taking them in Death Valley and Joshua Tree and posting those videos. Plus, we're going to have Office Hours resuming from its hiatus in April. So sign up for all that at HudsonHenry.com slash Office Hours. Links to everything I'm talking about in this video's description are over at HudsonHenry.com slash ATS links. Thanks, everybody, for being so supportive, for being such a cool community. Um, for sharing, like, and subscribing, just for being you. And I hope that you're all feeling safe, being creative, having fun, and we'll see you next week.